Marty, you want to call the roll, please? Yes. Mr. Acuna? Yes. Seattle? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? Here. Uh, Ms. Ward? Here. Mr. Webb? Here. All right. If you would all join me for the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Do I have a motion to adopt the agenda? So move. A second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> All right. Agenda's passed. Uh, we will, well, actually, we've got a meeting here. We don't have public comment listed anywhere. Right. It's supposed to just be a work session. This is actually just a work session, but we did add one item. Okay. Then do we need to have public comment? No. Okay. All right. Then we'll go on to the work session on Madison Park. Oh, sorry. I went to push the button. Don't need to do that. <laughs> I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Luke Meyer up to the mic again um, to actually share for us the modeling that they have done uh, on Madison Park. And as you remember, when we looked at um, Fellows property, which was just a couple weeks ago, one of the things that came out of that was the school board said um, that we also wanted to model to see if in fact there was a possibility at all to do anything on Madison Park um, that would not touch the fields, that would actually leave the fields, which the school board talked at length about the last time in the city when this was discussed um, and how it was quite contentious because they were going to take the whole kind of park for a school. So in modeling a one or two grade level solution, it, was it possible to even do that, to even entertain that thought? Um, and so that's what they're here to um, share with us tonight. And Allison, I'm not going to try to say your last name, but say it for me. Thank you. Um, she's also here as well and has done a lot of work on this project. So as Dr. Jones said, we've been asked to investigate the possibility of locating a one or two grade level school uh, at Madison uh, Park and spent some time walking around the park and evaluating what might be possible. So let me kind of walk you through. This is uh, an aerial of the park. The red line that you see surrounding the site is the property line. You see in the, um, I'll call it the upper left, there are a series of buildings that are commercial that face North Washington and uh, the church that's on the corner of Washington and East Columbia Street. And adjacent to the church is the historic house that at one time, I don't know whether the school board owned or? No, the I think it was the city owned it. Okay, the city owned it. Anyway, it was, it was part of the park. It no longer is. And um, you can see the size of the play fields and a basic idea of what's, what's around it. The park is really a, a lovely park. And as we walk through, trying to get a sense of, of what it was like, it's um, secluded. You'd never know it was one block from uh, North Washington. It's, um, the playing fields are actually surrounded by a berm, which makes it fairly um, private. Uh, there's some nice walking trails. And uh, as you go toward the back, uh, there are taller commercial buildings. The sunrise and the church are three and four stories, so the transition between the surrounding streets and the park are fairly high, but they are separated from the park with some landscaping. So you just get glimpses of the, uh, of the taller buildings. One of the things that we were asked to do is to make sure that we could retain the playing fields for the community. Uh, felt like there was some opportunity to retain a significant portion of the park depending upon the size of the school. We thought it was very important to retain the landscape buffer around the site simply so that it still was um, rather pastoral and, and uh, uh, gave that kind of a character. Uh, certainly any building here to be fit on the uh, property you're going to find is going to have to be three stories and so part of the issue is how do you reduce the scale, the apparent scale of the school so that it fits as well as possible. 
one of the keys, as I said, is that, you know, the Sunrise, the church, the other uh, commercial buildings are three stories. They're pretty tall. Uh, and so depending upon this, where the school is located, there is a potential for trend uh, as a transition. One of the issues is we need to accommodate a bus loop, and we're assuming plus or minus five buses, which I think and as an order of magnitude is pretty close to what you'd need. The other issue was we felt that it was important to minimize any traffic uh, through the neighborhood. And so um, as I go to the next slide, well, let me, you know, one of the things we're thinking is that you probably would want to access this slide through or from um, North Washington Street. You're only a block away. And uh, rather than coming through um, Lawton Street and go riding through the neighborhood, it made some sense to access the site through there. This is a, just a, a program illustrating the number of square feet that is uh, expected for a one-story or one-grade level school, which is a 37,000 plus or minus square feet. A two-grade level school will uh, require about 69,000 square feet, not quite double, but uh, it gives you a basic sense of the size of a one-grade level versus two-grade level. So we look at the um, site. We're talking about keeping these green buffers. Um, in yellow, talking about per potentially um, having school bus come down Columbia rather than through all the neighborhoods. This is an important drawing uh, because it illustrates some of the zoning around the perimeter of the site you see setbacks, either side yards, rear yards, uh, or front yards. And the uh, and you can see the size of the existing soccer fields or play fields. So when you look at what's available for development, you see the uh, part of the site that's just, I'll call it south or below the existing historic house, that whole sort of pipe stem that comes out has very little area that you could actually develop anything. So what you have is kind of the center of the site. The site slopes down probably about six feet at least. Uh, we're going right through the middle of the site and that blue line is an existing easement. We've been unable to uh, determine what's in that easement. We think it might be an electrical line or it's a reserved easement that has never been used. So. In any case, we don't think it's a detraction or a determinant, I think, that could be dealt with. So what you see, in effect, if you keep the soccer fields, is an area pretty much smack dab in the middle of the site in which you can build a new school. So we've, we have four options to show you. And there are reasons to show you all four. This is a school that's pulled to the front of the uh, site. And the idea was to retain as much of the park as possible. Uh, you see that to the left of the soccer fields, you can see the park parking. There are 27, 23 parking spaces there. And that's actually outside the property line of the park, which is interesting. So there's already existing about 23 parking spaces. And we went there several times during the middle of the day. And nobody had ever, was ever parking there. So just be aware that there is already 23 parking spaces. If you remember in the last uh, iteration we showed you at the previous site, the requirement was for around 20 parking spaces for a one grade level school. So that just keep that in the back of your mind, in, in effect. So this. Initial one is a one grade level school. It's pulled close to Lawton Street. Uh, we have uh, illustrated a parking lot access from East Columbia Street so that teachers or visitors could pull in uh, from East Columbia. Buses would turn on Lawton Street, and if you were going from right to left, pull in in front of the school at a bus drop off. That's about five buses long. So the children could get out on the, obviously, the passenger side and enter the school and the buses could leave. Now, frankly, this is uh, something that we have investigated on other schools and other districts. It will take some 
discussion with either your transportation folks or the city to find out whether pulling this off, and there is, it's hard to see, a green strip of about 15 feet between Lawton Street and the bus drop off. So it could be landscaping so that there, it's not just pulling off the street like diagonal parking. So as you walk in, there's dining, K&S is kitchen and storage, admin as you walk in, a couple of classrooms. As you go upstairs, uh, on a second floor, we are stacking more classrooms, steam room, uh, and the third floor, more classrooms. So what you see, in effect, and this will be it, that's one grade level school. So you can see that we've been able to retain the soccer fields. We've actually been able, we think, to retain or potentially slightly relocate the basketball court that you could see sort of ghosted um, to the top of the school. So to a certain extent, yes, we have taken a chunk of the park, but we have left quite a bit of the recreational aspects of the park. Um, it does have, this scheme does have an impact, obviously, on the houses across the street. But uh, once again, it leaves a great deal of, of green space. Uh, some quick sketches of kind of scale. We think we would need a roof kind of shape. We probably could add some dormers, but somehow try to reduce the scale as much as possible. The second option for a one grade level school, we actually on purpose pushed back from Lawton Street. And the reason behind this was we felt, you know, if we push it away from the residences across Lawton Street, it's going to impact those residences as little as possible. And then the school would be closer to the higher buildings, the Sunrise, the church, the other commercial buildings. And you have the ability to do more landscaping in front of the school. And uh, as you know, on Lawton Street, it's kind of a tree-lined street. It's a very nice street. And so it could retain some of its original character. So in this case, what we're illustrating, uh, rather than a bus loop right off of Lawton Street, we're saying that you're going to come down East Columbia. Uh, a bus is going to be able to pull in and drop off uh, directly. Kids walk to the school. And we're actually suggesting, in this case, to use the park parking lot uh, for school purposes during the day. So we have not duplicated it as we have in the first case. This is simply an investigation to show you combinations and permutations. So we're not recommending anything. We're simply showing you what some of the possibilities are. So in this case, it's a little bit more of a linear school. You come in, um, dining, um, support spaces, Upstairs, classrooms, pretty straightforward. Not a whole lot of classrooms on each level, six, seven classrooms on a level. Um, you could always use, obviously, the fields for the children. And there's enough green space around to give it a, a comp, uh, context. We're il simply illustrating a slightly different kind of a school, maybe with a pitched roof, more windows, push back. Once again, that's closer to the um, uh, larger buildings. Then we said, all right, what happens if this can be expanded? If, as you look at this option, you say, gee, can't you add another level, uh, another grade level here? You're not using the whole site. And the same thing here. Gosh, look at all that space behind the school. One of the things you need to know is that that basketball court is about six feet higher in grade and elevation than the school. Just uh, when it was constructed, there's a slope that goes up and then there's a plateau where the basketball court is. So the thought is, yes, you could turn this into, I'll call it a T-shape, and build on the basketball court, probably starting at the second level rather than the first, because if you simply burrowed into that, you'd have trouble with, win you know, having windows. And in the, uh, whoops, I'm sorry, and on this uh, second scheme that we showed you, rearrange this, pull it to the front, and could we actually get a two-level, two-grade level class uh, school here? So this is the first option illustrating how it can be expanded. In this case, because you've got two grade levels, we have retained both parking lots, both the park parking lot as well as this additional 20-car lot. You can see a little service drive going to the kitchen and the mechanical area. 
a bus drop off or bus loop right in front of uh, off of Lawton Street, the same that you saw previously. Whoops, I'm sorry. Uh, and in this case, um, you see that kind of white blob in back of the school. That's where the second second and third story would be. So what you're looking up top there is a second and third level. So you get more classrooms uh, per floor, which perhaps gives you more flexibility to have more classes per, per grade level. In this case, really all of the support spaces, all the shared spaces are on the ground level. And uh, the classrooms are up on the second level. And quite frankly, there's a plus or minus number of classrooms here. This is not exact, but uh, it makes a certain amount of sense. Um, once again, a fairly similar kind of an approach. It's just bigger, but it goes back, although it's facing the street. And on the second uh, concept, what we've done is once again brought most of the um, shared spaces to the ground level. In this case, we have not doubled the parking. We have only retained the 23 spaces at the park parking, although potentially you could add some additional parking. But you can see how difficult it is with the, quote, historic house and what we have left. Um, so really what it's best used for to us is some sort of circulation, whether it's a bus drop off, bus loop or parking, but it really can't be used for a building. It's really a little bit remote, although you could perhaps locate another playground in that green space, so uh, add something back to the community. Second and third level look like this. In this case, and I, I should have pointed this out, in many cases we've shown a two-level or two-story high dining area. Obviously, when you have two grades, you have a slightly larger dining area, you have slightly larger kitchen. Uh, and so there's enough space in here where it gives you some flexibility to um, add some other spaces. The dining in this case would be more of a multi-purpose uh, room where you could have dining as well as some other activities, including perhaps a PE program. So. Think of these as order of magnitudes and explorations of both how to use the site and what kind of a school might be established uh, on that site. Uh, concept, once again, uh, in this case, to be honest with you, one of the goals here was to have a short elevation facing Lawton Street. So you don't have a building that's parallel to Lawton, which has a bigger impact on the houses across the street. This has a much narrower frontage and it goes to the back of the site which enables you to have a minimal front in, it, in effect so it doesn't seem like it's quite as big from those folks who are uh, living on on Lawton Street but as you go back quite frankly uh, because of the historic house and really the parking lot for the church there's really not a whole lot to the, I'll call it the right-hand side of the building. So it makes sense to push the building over as far as possible, have service over there, since there's already a big parking lot for the church. Um, and so it made sense to, in a linear fashion, to go front to back in, in this kind of a scheme. Once again, some sketches on that. As we look at a comparison um, on both of these, these are both about 37,000 square feet. One's a little more, one's a little less, so let's call it about 37,000 square feet. Um, they're both three stories. One faces Lawton and uh, has its biggest face uh, elevation facing Lawton, but it gives back to the community the maximum park area because we're not using that basketball court. The second is a more linear scheme. It's pushed to the rear of the site for the purpose of retaining and re-landscaping along Lawton Street and minimizing the impact on the uh, neighborhood, but still retains the entire parking or uh, playing field uh, for the community. And in that front area it could be a playground, could be something else. So you have some opportunities there. On the two-grade level, we haven't really changed the in effect, the size of the lowest level facing Lawton Street. And uh, we don't really have a drawing of the second story because it's in that white um, rectangle to the rear. So it shows you the area that the two grade level school would take. And on the right hand side, 
once again, it's a linear scheme that goes front to back and tries to present a the minimal face of the school facing uh, Lawton Street. In all cases, don't take the architectural character literally. It was a very quick investigation of massing, to be honest with you, both so that we could figure out whether it made any sense and just to give you some illustrative representation of what we're talking about. So our conclusion uh, is that the site easily could accommodate a, um, whoops, I'm sorry, a once grade level school, has a fairly minimal impact on the site depending upon where it is. Uh, there probably is no particular problem on uh, parking. You see two options for a bus loop and, and for parking. And for a two level, or two grade level, I'm sorry, I'm going the wrong way again. On the two grade level scheme, the one on the left really has both parking lots, which you probably will need, assuming that that's the staffing that will be required for a two grade level school. And on the right, uh, it's something that we would want to discuss with you. So in both cases, discussing how bus loops work and the amount of parking, uh, it gives you an opportunity to really evaluate the impact of, of any school on, on Madison Park. So I'd be more than happy to, have I left something on Allison? Allison really did all the work, so. <laughs> <clears throat> yes? Hi, uh, just a quick question. Um, how many acres do, would the school sit on in either case? If the school is roughly um, on, on a, both one or two, it's about a half acre par, uh, footprint for the okay. school, a little less than a half okay. an acre. And then you add road work or access and you take a little bit more. I mean, an acre being what, 48,000? 40, but 40, 45,560 square feet. I think that's right. I have a question about option C and yes. that bus loop. Yes. Um, I, I know, like, I, I'm trying to visualize how big sure. that is. Um, but would the buses be able to actually turn back around to go up Columbia, or would they have to go down Lawton? No, we State? think that they could turn around. That's up almost 250 feet long, that, that um, drop off. So it's a little deceiving in terms of it looks small. But uh, we need about, excuse me, about a 50 foot radius. If a bus, whether it's a metro bus or any kind of a bus can drive through the neighborhood uh, and you can see the intersection of let's say um, uh, Lawton and uh, East Columbia you can see the kind of radius that's there so we, yes we believe it could. <coughs> to be honest with you if we push that bus loop back it would make it a little bit easier but uh, and that's something if it becomes important that would need to be investigated a little bit more. Well, on the radius you're talking about, I mean, you're talking about them basically doing a U-turn. Correct. Well, yeah, and pulling in the front and, and then going back out the way they came in. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so. Right. So they'd be going back up Columbia and Correct. Columbia Highway. Correct. And as I said before, because that set to that little pipe stem is such a small piece of property without, quote, development potential, it makes a lot of sense to use it for access. You've got a look on your face that says you have a question. <laughs> <laughs> You're just not sure what it is yet. I actually, at this point, don't have a question. Okay. But then, whenever the point is to have um, Parks and Recs to give a, their little, give some feedback, mm -hmm. you know, whenever. Yeah, no, I just wanted to see if we had any initial reaction, then we'll, we'll go over and give Danny an opportunity. I guess my, my question is, on things like option D, for two grades, how do you meet parking requirements? To be honest with you, I think uh, where you see the bus loop, I think that in one case you might have to put some teacher parking uh, on the bus loop. In theory, the teachers are there before the buses show up. Yeah, uh, it's not the most ideal situation. The other is really to um, reconfigure that bus loop a little bit differently. Um, and uh, either go back to a, uh, the situation that we have on option C, 
uh, which could happen. We could push that school back a little bit. The, the STEM space would have to be um, changed in terms of its shape because we're hitting the, the back uh, setback right there where, where it's shown. So um, it's tight. And um, I also don't know, to be honest with you, the impact that the uh, using all the park parking would have, except that, as I said, we've been there several times during the day and nobody's parked there. I Lawton Street is also a wide street, and um, along the park side, there are Aaron, signs Aaron, that could you give her a microphone? Oh, oh here, here. she is. Um, Lawton Street is a wide street, and um, along the park side, uh, there is signage that calls out for park parking only, so that could be an option too, that maybe some of those parking spots become for school staff. From right about where you see in this drawing, it says Madison Park, sort of in a, an angle, uh, very lightly, with a, also it says sight slopes down. From where about that uh, arrow head is to the left is what's signed park parking only. So. Right now, street parking is allowed and may not be ideal, but could also be used for the school, I assume. Yeah, I mean, I've, I, I've met this park a lot. My kids play soccer mm -hmm. on the field and we go to the park. So and we often park on there's right. people park both sides of the street and you can still get cars there. Um, it, did you look at um, how much the existing church parking lot that's close is used during the day? It's interesting. There is um, Hertz uh, rental parking in oh. the church parking lot there we kind of 10 spots that are signed for Hertz <laughs> I just recently Hertz out uh, when the um, Northgate opened and there's a Hertz in there and yeah I, that's when those that's they started using spots it? appeared over there at Hertz because that's that what's going to be my question what's the requirement for the two grade solution and then that the other option of if we can't park it it would be potentially reaching out to um, Crossman Church to potentially finish up lease out during the day or during the week. What could would be the remaining parking that we would need on on a site like that? Yeah. It certainly can be. But we're yeah. <laughs> way ahead of the game, I think, on that. But it would be an option. Yeah, there were very few uh, cars parked in the church parking lot during the day. Okay, and on all your options, it's. Like you said, a multi-purpose room. It's a cafeteria. Correct. It's a gym. It's yeah. That is correct. You you'll notice that, for instance, we don't we're not showing restrooms and and other things. We've used uh, kindergarten-sized classrooms to illustrate classrooms because we know that's bigger than you need, and so the footprint is large enough to make sure that we can get, you know, electrical closets, restrooms, that sort of thing, and and. And, and after our last meeting, remember we all said that we wanted Tony to connect with Wyatt just to let him know that we were doing this and she did that. So this is not, you know, a surprise to, to anyone. But uh, Danny, do you want to say anything? We've got the, the head of parks for the city here. You don't have to because, I mean, well, obviously you're seeing this great. today for exactly. the first time. and. We are recording, and you'll be held to everything you say. <laughs> Hello, Danny Schlitt, uh, uh, Falls Church uh, City Staff, Recreation and Parks Department. Um, you're exactly right. This is the, the first time I'm seeing this, so I don't want to get too far into it. And obviously, um, I come from a different side of things as a park as opposed to schools, and I couldn't agree more with the gentleman's earliest statement saying it's a lovely park right now. Um, it looks to me like one day it, it's possible it might be a lovely school, but it would no longer then be a lovely park at that point. Um, the uh, couple of comments I would make in regard to just the, the preliminary uh, design would be, one, the, the love the idea of the effort to keep the soccer fields available and all that and, and as a community uh, field. I can tell you that just like TJ, the amount of use they would have with a, day, a daily use from the schools and then the, the needs from recreation and parks. We have 300 kids that use those fields, about 30 teams practice on them each week and about 30 teams play on them as a game 
field, we would not be able to keep that field in playing condition um, that we would need to use it as a competition field. And right now it's the only competition field for the little bitty kids um, that we have in the city that we can kind of control when we use it and such. So one thing I would certainly say that if there was, if this goes, um, you know, keeps moving uh, forward and gains some momentum, that the consideration of, of uh, synthetic turfing that field would probably be an extremely um, advantageous uh, 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 decision um, for everybody involved. That would make that field available and usable, you know, 24-7. We're not going to put lights on it, so obviously we lose anything outside of daylight, but that would certainly be one um, major piece that I would, I would say. Um, the... Um, a couple of other things I would note is that, uh, in my opinion, the basketball court would be um, certainly less um, needed than a playground would. And the, and the school itself plops itself right on top of the current playground. I would say that if you had to lose one or the other, the basketball court would be one that you would probably be willing to give up. And especially in terms if there was some kind of a play area inside the school um, as opposed to the playground. Uh, the playground gets used heavily over there. I would say that the, the park itself, including the old Pendleton House, which is the historic home, we called it the Pendleton House, um, uh, was uh, put together really through a series of master park planning. So it was a process that went on for um, several years and then the master plan implementation was one of the first ones we went through after all the master park planning took place. But um, the uh, uh, neighbors really put that together and so um, as I found out through the news press and with, with um, uh, the the, the um, uh, survey of the week or what, what is it the you know was was should we turn Madison Park into you know where should we put the next school it, it, it probably is something that um, obviously the neighbors would be heavily involved in but um, it would also it might behoove the city to look back into <laughs> we just sold it a few years ago but looking at trying to purchase that home back and in adding that space back in it certainly would give maybe the possibility of moving the school even further away from what is now the park and the opportunity to do to do that that. The playground itself, I would also tell you, is used by the K-Care behind it as its um, uh, state qualifying uh, piece to their preschool. Um, uh, you're required to have a playground within a certain number of area that the kids can go play at. So that would be another uh, considering factor that you would want to um, uh, get involved in over there. Um, so, you know, again, it's the first day I've seen it. I haven't had an opportunity to really um, look and see what would be going on, but there was off, an awful lot of uh, conversation once word got out that this is something that's, you know, uh, being considered. I don't know that the, the city has had any um, formal discussions with school board in regard to whether or not, you know, that, that's all stuff, I guess, that comes for the future, but um, certainly, um, uh, this being the time, I think it would certainly uh, behoove everybody um, uh, if you want to win win out of this then then to you know kind of uh, start working in that direction in, in a in a in, you know in a in a way that we can all sit down and work together with the neighbors with the recreation parks advisory board with the the folks. Will it be a park when it's done it's it's you know it's debatable. Um, or, or will it be a school site with maybe a field to be used? So um, just a few things I would, I would consider as you go forward. Yeah, I mean, the point of this was to see if a school there of one or two grades was even feasible because it is awkwardly shaped and it's got a bunch of different slopes and right. we're not going to lose the fields. And so that's all this was, was is, it, is something even feasible? <coughs> and then, you know, now that we have the answer of, well, if you do it this way, it could be, then we'll see where we go. But right. Yeah, anything after this, I mean, well, the reason we made sure Tony's first stop was why it was exactly what you were talking about. So. Right. Yeah, no, I understood this was kind of a stone unturned, uh, you know, uncovering kind of a uh, process that you'd go through and, every, and lots of different properties would be looked at. But um, uh, it certainly was something that caught me a little bit by surprise and, and was not aware that it had certainly come to, to this point where there's, you know, once you start talking schematics and things like that, certainly the assumption by some will be that this is a done deal and that, right. and now we get back into a situation where there's a lot of questions, but, you know, you can just get yourself yeah. into a, no, a, no. a and, bad and place. If we put you in an awkward position, I, I apologize. It's, you know, not something we intended to do. 
but thank you for your time. Oh, sure. Thank one, you. one question yeah. is the parking right now for the park, it's not in the park, but what is that? That's. Is that East? It was originally going to be Great Falls Street. Right. Okay. So Great Falls Street would come straight across Washington Street, and uh, it still lines right up with Great Falls Street. It just was never used for that purpose. There was an easement that went through. Um, and originally, obviously, the, the red line was much bigger when the city owned it for a school previously, um, where the um, sunrise is and all that. So that red area opened up a lot more when it was once a school. <laughs> it's now reduced down to a much smaller area but that that originally was a street it was it was going to be great falls street um and so uh it basically is city property because it was a street so that's why it's not connected to the actual piece of property right now um and there's a lot of uh gas lines and stuff under there but i don't know whether that comes into play right now yeah. there's, a, there's a large system under there so. I have a quick question for danny do you do you not have any idea how much that house was sold that piece of land was sold for I, I'm not 100% sure, so I don't want okay. you to quote me on this, but I believe it was about 625. Okay. Or like the, and the size of the plot, do you know if it's like a quarter of an acre? Or <coughs> like quarter I don't acre recall the, okay. the size of it, but um, mm -hmm. obviously it, it yeah. kind of would it's be a house. nice piece to have not gotten rid of as you're looking at things like this. And we certainly at one time looked into uh, whether or not we could add more uh, soccer field space over there. And unfortunately, after we sold it, we realized that we kind of lost our opportunity um, to do that, which was we would have put another small uh, size field over there. Well, and the, the sale of the house was part of the 2009 economic downturn belt type. It was. Which didn't make anybody happy. But one thing you said that, that I should have said, one reason we did this is we get a lot of questions from people saying, what about the Madison school site? Why can't you put a school back at Madison's? So. Well, and, and that was my point when I said that Madison school site is a portion of what the Madison school site was. And so it's and that'd be an important thing to tell folks that we don't have the Madison school site anymore. We've got a piece of the matter. Basically, if you wanted to really bring it down, we have the what was the open space of the Madison School site and the, the footprint for the school and all that kind of uh, anything that was taken over by in, uh, impervious stuff has been basically, you know, sold off over the years. Okay. Phil, welcome. I don't know if you've got any questions, if you saw it on the train or anything, but, you know, any follow up afterwards. But anybody else? No? Okay. Well, thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Danny. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. All right. So next steps on this, I would say, is think about it as we look at other properties. I mean, the whole idea was to see if it's possible. We know something is possible. Whether we go forward or what we do going forward is a separate issue. So any other questions? Okay. You're, you're released. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you. So much. All right, next uh, we get on to complaints policy. Um, and uh, Tony, could you just remind me, this, this came up in the summer, and I'm trying to remember, what was the genesis? Is this part of our normal review of policies? or did this come up on its own? Right, this was a school board requested item on that list, and actually we need to update that list yeah. again. We'll do that for next Tuesday. Um, and it really came out of um, a patron having a complaint against a school board member. We had a complaint against the superintendent, and trying to figure out these weird kind of complaints, what, how you handle them and what you do with them. Um, that's where the topic first came up. Okay. All right. So. We've had a couple different things floating around. I guess the real question is, how does anybody feel this policy hasn't worked and what needs to be fixed? Because part of the question is, do we have something that's not working or do we have something that's just not working well? So I don't know if anybody's got any anything to start. I mean, what, what I tried to do, and we've, we've obviously got a couple different things. One is a draft that I had sent, another one that was Phil. You had sent that, what, back in August? Early August. Something like that. Um, what I tried to do was make it as simple as possible because, to me, it's a, it's a balancing act. Because the bottom line is, when it comes to complaints, I'm always going to give 
the teachers, the staff, and the administration the benefit of the doubt that they're doing what they should and doing it correctly. So we need to balance giving them the benefit of the doubt with making it clear to people that they can complain if they want to, how they complain, what will happen, but also not doing it in such a way that we make it easy for people to take a piece of paper, check a couple boxes, sign it, and then suddenly you've got complaints coming in a lot. So that's why I said we've got to figure out a way to separate real complaints that could be acted on from people who are just complaining about something, but it's not actually a complaint in itself. And, and I admit I'm a bit at a loss as to how we can do that or if we should even try because I think we're going to end up parsing too many things and creating problems rather than fixing them. So. And so I like the I liked the Berkeley model because it did say you know we t- we we welcome your comments and your feedback and should bring them to us and for your specific issues here's how you would go then the procedure deals with here's how you'd actually go about dealing with each of these things so it does provide it doesn't state it in the policy these are the things that we consider to be complaints but it does say you know here are some here's where you would put these complaints so you could look and be like oh, okay well. It's not a complaint about the school board or a complaint about a grade or a teacher or the superintendent or it's not, I'm not being harassed. And then you're like, okay, does it fit into any of these categories? Maybe it's not. Maybe this isn't the right avenue for it. Um, but so my comments on yours is that one thing, the word credible is how we determine what what is a credible complaint and who decides what's credible and what's <coughs> credible to me may not be credible to you, may not be credible, you know, the person bringing the complaint, it's very credible to them, but who decides what is credible and what's not credible? No, and that's why I said some of it is by definition going to be subjective, and I'm not sure how we get past that. It's sort of like when we were talking about responding to public comment, we can't respond to all, so by definition you're responding to some and not others, and you can't have a you know, a rubric where you say, okay, on these 10 factors, if you get a score over five, congratulations, you get a reply. If you've gotten five or below, well, then, you know, try again later. No, I, I, I agree, and that's one of, my, one of my problems. I guess the question for Tony is, right now, how is it done? Because obviously, if somebody comes in and says, I don't like the way that picture looks, that's not a complaint, but how do you separate things now? Well, I mean, part of it you do have to invoke common sense. I mean, unfortunately, but, you know, and I think I was giving you an example today. Just um, when I look at complaints in the last 24 hours, you know, somebody who's unhappy about their bus stop, um, but they've, I've, we've rerouted them back to transportation. That's where they started. They went to Nancy. They were unhappy with what Nancy's response was from the department. Then they come to me. I go out, check the bus stop. I either route it back to Nancy and say, okay, in this instance, I think the parent has a valid point. Um, or I have to pick up the phone and call and say, look, I have to, you know, this is the support of the transportation department. Here's why the stop is where it is. And we don't have a lot of flexibility um, to fix it. It. you know that's just one example and I'm trying to think what was I was telling you another one today um, a bus issue and then there was something else mm-hmm. do you remember what it was anyway it was something else I was dealing with it's very much kind of a common sense about you know it, it either is an issue or it isn't an issue and we try to respond as to the person directly as much as we can when it when it is probably more I feel like more serious is when it's complaining against a staff member and a parent is oh I know what it was it was paying five dollars to get the ball game that was the other complaint but it's an important complaint to this person but we're not gonna have a lot of flexibility in resolving that complaint and so for me to bring a complaint like that to the school board um, it seems to me like it would not be advantageous as far as our time. Um, but it doesn't mean we're not going to listen and <coughs> take the ideas and thoughts. Um, if it's a complaint against an employee, one of the first things we do, first of all, is if it even sounds like it's a complaint against an employee, it kicks, kicks to Lisa. I'm not in it. And Lisa's going to, first of all, ask if it's a formal complaint. And then Lisa, I'm going to turn it over to you and say, if it's a formal complaint, often the parent will say, well, no, 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 I don't want to get anybody in trouble. I'm just frustrated. And then, you know, we're trying to work with the parent. If they say that, yes, I'm, this is a formal complaint, and then Lisa, you might share what your process would be. Usually I will listen to, you know, what the concern is. And if it's something that I need to 
deal with it immediately than I will. Otherwise, I usually send it back to the principal and say, if you've spoken to the principal, if you haven't, let's go back to the principal, have that conversation. And then the principal handles it <coughs> at the school level. Um, and if it's a formal complaint where, you know, a child's been hurt or whatever, then it's really taking that complaint and actually going out and, and doing a true investigation where I invest, I meet with the, the person who's being accused, I meet with anyone who may have been involved uh, or have, have witnessed the incident, um, and then gather all the information and usually go talk to whoever our legal person is at that point to try to figure out how to, how to address it. Um, and then depending on what the outcome is, we'll determine whether it's a reprimand, you lose your job, what? what the thing and then is if it's if it's a recommendation for termination then it would go to the superintendent and then the school board for that well but if if you say to somebody is this a formal complaint mm -hmm. and they say yes the word formal kicks off what and what makes it aspect. what makes it formal it, 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 the investigative but and then it, the, but and what do they have to do i mean is it okay i want it in writing in this <laughs> format or what what makes it formal other than the word sometimes i will ask for it to be in writing, but my understanding is that they, you can't make them put it in writing. But then I take notes as to what the complaint is, and yeah, I will say to the individual, yeah, they meet with me, and I will say I'm, right, I'm documenting you know, what you're discussing with me, just so that we have it written down somewhere. Yeah. Okay. And then we always circle back with the person at the end as well, so they know what the result was. Mm -hmm. and yeah, okay. yeah it, it's important to know that when no, Ms. High uses the word formal, this is perfect. In, in accordance with the existing policies that it's really about harassment and discrimination and that's the only place in our existing policies where the formal procedures apply so those are complaints against employees they're complaints against um, visitors to the building they would be complaints against student to student or peer to student or teacher, um, to teacher. teacher to teacher right so but it's about harassment and discrimination well so, and that's specifically not this that's correct it's a, that's exactly right so today it, if someone were to say, I'd like to make a formal complaint about the picture that's on the wall, there isn't a path that's delineated, right? I mean, it, it, there's no administrative regulation to go along with policy 5.4. Um, it just says complaints from the public will be dealt with, but it doesn't describe the path, and there's no administrative regulation that describes a path. Okay, so by definition, this policy would not deal with Anybody who is employed either full time or part time? Uh, it, well, I, mean, what, I think what you're saying is it doesn't, it wouldn't deal with employment discrimination or harassment or practices related to those things, which is always going to be dealt with in a separate policy. Okay, but people could still make complaints against employees using this or not? Because we have a section called Complaints Against Employees. Right. They should not use 5.4 for specific complaints against employees. They should use the Section 8.9 8. 8. 8. 9 policy. Okay. So what should this be used for? Complaints not against employees and complaints not regarding harassment and discrimination. I don't like my child's teacher. I don't like my bus stop. I don't like that picture hanging on the wall. I mean, those are all complaints we get on a daily basis. I don't like that the cafeteria food is outsourced. Um, I'm giving you real ish, real ones, you know. Yeah, I guess, see, to, to me, I, I have a problem figuring out, you know, I don't like the cafeteria food being outsourced. To me, that's, com that's complaining as opposed to a complaint. <laughs> But they want me to fix it. I don't know. That's a pretty bad food. No, it's a, it's a yeah, you know, it's I mean, a, but that's a complaint. You know, that's a, yeah. if a lot of kids yeah. aren't eating the food and the food's getting thrown away, well, which is what's talking about Daniel, that's a I separation. mean, which everyone knows, like it's, it's, well, you know, that's a, and then you can say, listen, here's, thank you. And here, I know Tony, you know, Dr. Jones has responded to this complaint before, <laughs> like that's one that she can handle and say, this is why we're doing it this way. And, well, and a prime example yeah. would have been the first week or probably the first five, six days of school, the outsourcing food company was not following the menu. And so you had children who thought they were going to have tater tots and chicken nuggets. I don't know, whatever it was. But, um, you know, what showed up was something that either was like a milk product or peanut product that then the child had an allergy and couldn't there was no lunch there. Um, but over that period of five days, we were dealing with parent complaints saying, the menu's not correct, my child's not, you know, they, don't, they, they didn't want to eat because they'd eat the peanut butter and jelly or whatever because the menu was wrong. I mean, that's just a very basic complaint, but 
that's one where we resolve the problem by going back to Richard Kane and saying the wrong food is showing up because he's not on site every day and fixing the issue. Right, but to me that's something that can be fixed as opposed to my kid doesn't like the menus, which is right. the menu's the same for all the kids. If your kid doesn't like the menu, we can't change the menu for your kid. I mean, that's why I said I was trying to get to how do you decide something that's That's really where it comes to, back to the administration, the you know, discretion to make good decisions and be able to say to the parent, you know, we only have so many choices with an outsourced company of what the menu can be. We do really watch what the kids are throwing away. We will, you know, we listen to what they like to eat and don't like to eat. And if there's something they don't like to eat, we actually take it off the menu. We have added, you know, extra spices and ask for extra things and made adjustments and 99% of those issues really are are resolved I mean they're resolved at the school level our principals do a really really good job most of the things we deal with are really they're usually staff against staff or parents against a teacher or something of that nature very I mean I get very very really major complaints that aren't resolved quickly um, that are simple yeah yeah, so that's why I'm trying to figure out what, what are we trying to do with this since it seems like it's working 99% of the time. I mean, I think some, some improvements can be made, especially what, what Aaron found about reminding people that individual school board members, no matter how sympathetic you are, can't fix anything because you're just an individual school board member. But what it comes down to is what's, what we've got seems to work. So... How do we not take 99% and decrease that success rate? Let's start this. Is, is what uh, Ms. Gill is, is recommending, is that uh, worth including in there? I mean, everything, this is a work session, so everything's up for discussion. What, when I looked at the Berkeley thing, to me, it was, it was long and complicated and- Well, it, their policy is short. Yeah. The procedures then, are long. Well, see, that's just it. It, I mean, the the policy is nice, but you still end up going. You know, if you want this, you get this. If you want that, you get that. But, I mean, but, but but and I and I have to admit, I haven't gone through that whole thing. But does central office or the superintendent go through? While it's not written in our policy, does she go through the same something. thing that the Berkeley folks oh, go through? Yeah. You, uh, right. So the difference here being, ours is not documented. They've documented a process, and so would it would it hurt to 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 streamline ours? Because uh, Tom's been sort of updating these things over time. Would this constitute an update that sort of enc encompasses, you know, sort of covers our, our risk a little bit more? You know, I don't know. I is don't it a, is it an improvement? But Aaron had a point. I mean, there's there's the policy, and then there's the implementation, and we right. wouldn't ever put implementation in the policy. So right. they're they're two different so things. So we have to be careful. Right. So um, you have you have like the Berkeley example that was provided. We have a relatively short policy. Um, what Berkeley has behind that policy is a rel relatively complicated administrative procedure that we could not implement because we don't have the staffing positions and con position controls that that division has. Um, but we don't have an administrative regulation to implement the policy at all. So what we run into are those potential complaints that don't fall into a specific category where there is a formal procedure like a harassment or discrimination complaint. Um, and the board in particular is left to question how do we deal with this particular complaint if it's not something that the superintendent can deal with? Um, so an administrative reg regulation would provide some of those, provide some of that guidance, but the school board doesn't traditionally and probably shouldn't write administrative regulations. What they can do is direct the superintendent to create an administrative regulation to support the school board's policy. Um, so you could eventually end up with a rewrite of 5.4 that addresses any of the concerns you have in the current language and then direct the superintendent to craft a regulation to support it. So right now we have a policy that has no implementation procedure. Correct. And we have 260 policies and there's probably less than a quarter that have administrative regulations that support them because they're not necessary. But we may be learning that this is one that might need one. Okay. So it seems like what we should be doing is asking for implementation policy 
regulation. I think that's where regulation. we really are stumbling is the implementation policy. So, you know, someone says, I have this complaint, like, what do I do? Who do I tell? Who do I, what do I do next? And they don't really know. Um, well, except the and I mean, that, chain then, of command. And then they have to go, yeah, but we know what chain of command means. But like, if I'm a citizen, and I don't, I have a question. I have, I don't know what that means. I'm not sure who I go to or what I do. Um, so maybe I take it right to the superintendent, which is probably not the best place to immediately take it. Um, you know, that just takes everything to the superintendent. Or if you know, if we just put this up on something up on a website, you know, at the superintendent figures out what works for her and her staff or him and his staff, whoever comes in next, um, has it there. And then the person can come online and say, oh, I have a complaint about my bus stop. Here's what I should do about it. Like, here, I've got a complaint. Just, you know, high level categories. You're like, okay, I have a complaint about the school board. I don't like what Miss Gill said the other day. And I want to complain to somebody about it. So they say, okay, I submit a formal complaint to the superintendent because I don't like what she said. You know, just... Okay, so basically, yeah, just people know what to do. We all agree that we should and ask for should look at what Phil administrative procedures. Well, just <clears throat> I, first off, I I think the way this actually came up was a little bit more complicated than what we said before because the um, general counsel presented a change to five four, and we actually had a I recall a fairly long discussion about it and what our concerns were, and then we decided we were going to come back to it in a more detailed way. And certainly some of the motivations around that were the fact that there had been a number of complaints that were hard to deal with. Uh, I, I think that what we've been talking about in terms of having the right administrative regulation and the right policy to go with it is, is pretty much um, spot on, uh, that we probably ought not try in the policy to set all of the things that you would want in administrative regulation. But I think it's. I think there have been problems with the current policy. I mean, I just when I read it, I don't know what it means. And you know, I've read a lot of regulations. It is a it is a bundle of unclarity. All that said, I don't think we want to write something that you know unduly formalizes things that don't need to be formalized. As the superintendent said, you know, 99.9% .9 of these things are resolved. You don't want to say, well, you know, if you don't like the way the picture looks and you have to fill out this form and submit it in triplicate. That's not where we want to be. We want to resolve things. But, you know, there does come a point where somebody says, no, I'm really angry. I want something to happen. And I think it's incumbent on us to have a policy and a set of procedures that at least surface that, tell a person you know, what to do about it, and then have a means to process it. Um, and it feels at least to me like, um, in, in one particular case, which is the complaint dealing with the actions of the chair and the vice chair, that that's sort of sat in limbo for a while because nobody really knows what to do with it and how to process it. And so I just want to make sure that we've got a set of means that let us answer those sorts of questions, whether complaints are frivolous or very well taken, and respond to them, in, in part because I want to make sure that we've got a means that looking at things and deciding them so that people do come in when they want to have a complaint, um, give it to us to try to resolve it first rather than filing something in circuit court in Arlington County. So, I mean, I think there's some things that we ought to do. Um, I think, you know, what I wrote originally probably spilled way too far into actually um, being the administrative regulation scheme. Uh, but I think there's, we can do something more than what we've got right now in terms of at least describing with clarity what the policy is and how the school board is going to act on these things and how things come before it. And before that, it's you know, the superintendent and the staff's role. Other comments? Okay. So I guess the question is, do we sort of split it and ask for staff to come back with ideas about how the procedures should be in place and then work on the policy at the same time? Because I mean, right that now works we have for, if that would be, I don't know, you know, it's part of it's also like what's helpful for the staff, what's helpful for someone, I mean, like it's a, it's the a complaint against, egg. complaints against the school board, you know, that's something else. I don't think anyone knows what to do or that if you can complain against the school board. You can. Yeah. The school board doesn't approve it. Well, no, I know, this, I know the school board doesn't approve regulations, but it is a bit of, you, you have a policy that has to get implemented, but partly I think we want to see, even with what we have now, how would you implement this policy before we talk about adding anything else to it in terms of specificity, because it could be that 
there's a whole lot less we would want to add as opposed to you know getting more into the administrative side. My suggestion, Mr. Chairman, would be that we re rewrite the policy first. I don't know how we can ask the staff to write a regulation when the policy is in flux. So uh, I think the exercise for us ought to be what ought to be in the policy. What do we write, want to write down that's really a supreme, uh, sorry, a school board <laughs> level decision. We're reading too many cases lately. <laughs> um, and then we write it down, and then we, at that point, ask the administration to write a regulation um, to the extent it's required to deal with those sorts of things. I, I would normally agree with it, but we have a policy that works 99% of the time now. So what is the 1% that we're going to add to this that should make getting an implementation policy wait? If this were only hitting it 50% of the time, yeah, I would agree. But it seems like we've got a policy that generally works. The question is what's missing that we want to add into the policy to cover that other 1%. So that's why I was saying it's a chicken and egg, and I'm not sure that they – I realize that it would be best to say, this is the policy, go tell us how you're going to do it. <laughs> but we've yes, got a policy that works 99% of the time. I would love somebody to tell us how it's working 99% of the time now. And then that, I think, will help us say, okay, so what we're missing is this part. But I, I understand your point, and, and if we were starting from new, I would completely agree, but we've got something that, you know, nobody seems to disagree has been working. I think we should be told. Uh, I mean, I can certainly answer that from my perspective and from talking to people. I don't know if others would agree, but I think it, it doesn't work very well when there are complaints against the school board, senior staff, or people feel like their um, complaints have not been adequately resolved um, at the administrative level and don't understand there's a way to at least ask the school board to take a look at it. I think those are the cases where the people get the most exercised about what's happening. It's not the informal process. It's not the anything but the hard cases. It's the hard cases. Well, I guess then a question for Tom is, do we only need to ask you to do procedures for the hard cases? Or would that be only doing half a loaf. Yeah, so um, it, this would because be my perspective that I'll pass on to my uh, successor. Um, but, but my perspective is that the difficulty lies in, in deciding when it comes in whether it will be a hard one or an easy one. And that's where the administrative regulations that will guide staff decisions will be important. Um, because someone can come in and say that this is an informal, um, but it might be an allegation of, um, of um, impropriety by a senior staff member or by a superintendent. And they, they, or they might say, I, I really think a school board member has crossed the line here, but I want it to be informal. Um, and the staff needs to know what the topics are that generate certain responses. And that would be in the regulation as opposed to policy. So I, if I were to offer advice about how this gets constructed, it would be for the board to determine the language that's missing from the policy, whether, and, and policies are, are philosophical statements about what you believe in. So make the decision about what you want the complaint policy to do, right? Do you want everything funneled to the lowest possible level? That's a general philosophical statement that I think most complaint policies would have. If you believe that, then that's in there. If you want to make it clear that there are items that rise to school board level or that the school board has discretion in all items, um, then you put that in the policy. And then the regulations support those paths, right? Thank you, Doc. Yeah, John, for instance, um, I'm not a policy worker, I'm not a legal person, but looking at the amended version, I like that paragraph that outlines the role of the individual board members. That would be an addition I'd, I'd support being in there, I mean, it it, it right. doesn't. The, you the talk about saying it. individuals. I think can't it's really helpful anything. to people to. That's something. That's something you mean. But I also right, like the part saying like we we welcome your right. Your I mean, feedback. It, it's working ninety nine yeah. percent of the time, but we can still finesse it or at least bring it up to date, if you know what I mean. Oh yeah, no, I'm not saying don't change it. I'm just saying we need to make sure if we change it, we're not affecting the ninety nine percent that does work. That's my point. We just need to yeah. make it so that we feel like it's working 100% of the time. Or, or it, it, can, it can handle any new situations that, that will come up. Right. And I think that's why it needs to be more simple than prescriptive, because then it would 
I think be an umbrella that would handle more as opposed to stove pipes where if, you know your complaint doesn't fit into the right ball with okay. the right tube it'll just fall off and get ignored okay so okay so I guess the next step is um, well, let me talk with Justin I guess we'll do another draft and try to get it as simple as possible and then ask for implementation implementation procedures to be drafted I do I do think it's important to add in some language about retaliation and that if you bring a compl if you have a complaint or you have a concern you will not be retaliated against you there will be no retribution that you know that it's that you can feel yeah, I, is it in there now because I didn't see it in it's it's under your um, harassment and discrimination that's but where it's not in the complaints in. from the public right well I think the point is even if it's you know, so something that it's there, a legal even if it's, concept it's in both applies places. to everything, mm -hmm. putting it in here specifically yeah. wouldn't be a bad thing. Just so people, it, right. it is it is our, I think, you know, our our philosophy and our, you know, and our overarching vision that we community engagement and we, we welcome, you know, we, wel we want to hear from you, uh, you know, try to resolve it, like I said, informally or try to, and, but if that doesn't work, here's what you do next. And you won't be retaliated against and remember individual school board members cannot solve your problem for you because I don't I don't think people really know that you can tell them but it's you know it's just good to that I think that it makes it a more helpful policy and it's more user friendly as well so someone can read it from the public and say oh okay well, I kind of get what this means because there's a lot of inside baseball when you read it you don't really understand like I don't know well, what, do I do what we need this? to do is write it so that if somebody only reads this and this is all they see about complaints, they get everything and they don't have to go somewhere else and say, oh, they, they can't harass me, they can't retaliate against me. Oh, another policy says they're, they're open to hearing from us. If this is the only thing they read, it should have everything from we want to hear from you, an individual can't resolve it, we won't retaliate, and this is what you do to get, you know, to some sort of closure on what you're what your issue is so if it's redundant of other things yeah I, I think redundancy okay. is is one of the hallmarks of policy making in policies that they are often quite redundant well and, and I think it's and, and for a good reason nobody's gonna read yeah. all the policies yeah. if they've got a complaint they're gonna go to the that. complaint policy and that's all they're gonna read I mean I know that's yeah. what I would Staff do could feel harassed by a bear. No. Mm -hmm. okay anything else Bigger challenge. no okay um, seriously would include it. Yeah, I mean, I. All right, moving on to the consent agenda. Uh, did anyone have any questions for Tony? You all saw my email earlier. No need for a closed session like we normally have, so I would just ask for unanimous consent that the consent agenda be agreed to. Hearing no objections, so ordered. Um, I mentioned this. Uh, materials for board review. Responses to public questions. Tony, you want to explain? Um, as you remember, when we had our work session and your, the school board discussed how we were responding to public comment or public questions, um, and one of the the things that you asked to do is either on the dais if it was a quick and easy answer or a follow up if, if somebody can. And I did say I would follow up with a question that had to do with budget back in 2014-15. So we're trying this to see if this uh, meets the pleasure of the board to put responses to public questions here, and you just post it on the next kind of meeting that we can, you know, gather the information. But again, this is the response to that question uh, that was brought up. We said we would get out again. We had put it out once before, um, but again, this is from 2014-15. It was a budget question. So that's on there for a response. Okay. And actually, Tom, a question for you I've been meaning to answer. Lately, when we get questions from the public that go to everybody, the chair has been answering and replying to all. That's allowable because he's replying to a person and others are copy that's not replying all to another school board member, right? Uh, so um, in, in the context of, of the Freedom of Information Act, the reply all is not prohibited, right? It's, it's the um, continuity of time, right? So if it's, if it's a back and forth exchange, then it would be prohibited. So the fact that uh, uh, an email comes in addressed to all of you that, that one of you then responds to at some point later, say 15 minutes, 20 minutes later, 
Um, we haven't begun a back and forth discussion of public business among school board members. So, but if, but if the initial email is from a member of the public, not the school board, it doesn't matter. Yeah, any any, oh, okay. any reply all that is separated by a significant length of time um, fails to meet the definition of a meeting. So my advice to you has always been to never reply all because then you don't have to worry about when you sent the email or how long you need to do it. Um, one of you responding to all of you, but only re but in essence replying to a member of the public doesn't begin any back and forth exchange between right. two of you, right? Um, so that reply all from the chair so that you're all aware of it has no concerns with regard to the Freedom of Information Act. Okay. If, if all of you want to then respond to that member of the public and you all do it contem contemporaneously, right, within a few minutes, then we've got an issue. But a singular reply all um, doesn't cross the line of a public meeting. Okay, so if all of us got a note from a member of the public about something a day and a half ago and decided today to re respond to it and reply all, that would be fine. If all of you did it no, at no, this, no, no, no. no. If, if, if one, one of member, you did it on behalf of the board, no, that's fine. Well, or not even on behalf. If someone just, just wanted on to their, give their public op their opinion and make sure that everybody else on the board knew and the member of the public got a response from you, that just run person. the risk that you're both not doing it at nine thirty and nine thirty two. Yeah, in the morning. right. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yes, that the reply all becomes dangerous when you remove the constraints of don't do it, right? So if, if you know that, that it's not a violation to do it once, um, then the temptation is to do it regularly or do it twice or say, well, I'm sure I'm gonna be the only one to respond, so let me go ahead and respond. And, and then someone else wants to not feel one-upped, so they respond too, and then you end up with the, the Hill case in Fairfax County where there's just a lot of back and forth. And um, now, it, Keep, that's the seminal case in Virginia about what when an email creates a meeting. However, even in that case, that it, it was determined that all of those back and forth exchanges were not a meeting. So again, the, the guidance you guys have always been provided is ultra conservative. The reply all is a means to the slippery slope of you're going to cross the line at some point if you all do it. So a singular reply all never creates a meeting. But you can't be sure it'll be a singular reply. That's correct. Okay. The first one, right, is always free. Um, but if it continues beyond the first one, then you run the risk of having a meeting. So I, I was wanting to know, like, if, if you want it to reply, you want it to respond to, a, say, a citizen, mm -hmm. but you want it, all the board members copied on it. If you start a new email stream, is that considered? Yeah, no, so it's a good point. So the... the, the um, the way you would end up with a meeting, right, is if there's a back and forth among more than two board members. So if you've removed them from the string or you've BCC'd them so that they can't get back in the string, then you sort of put up the safeguard, right, in the fence that says there's, no, there's not going to be a back and forth on this exchange because they can't reply to me about this. Does that make sense? So I would, I would say uh, starting a new string and not including any school board members doesn't well, risk violating a meeting, uh, the open meeting laws. What if you want it to keep everyone sort of informed? I would suggest your, that you don't do that. You do? Because you, that you, if we all decided to do that, no, no, we no, want to keep not, everybody informed. I'm not saying, I'm not replying all. I'm saying I'm starting a brand new email no. and said thank you for your email. But if you did it in, in, in the context of Phil just sent me one, so let me open up a new one and I'll start a new one, right, it, it's going to be the content of the discussion, not the fact that it all occurs in <coughs> one string. Okay. So gotcha. contemporaneous emails from all of you, all being new strings, would still potentially violate the open meeting well, Yeah, I mean, contemporaneously. But if it was a couple days later and you wanted to respond to yeah. somebody, you started a new string, Correct. send it to that person, copy the board. Right. So that's different. Separated by days is never a, a concern right. with okay. regard to open meeting laws. It's, it's more of a, it, it has to be pretty close in time. It does. Okay. It needs to be similar to a phone call, right? Something along those lines. What is that minimum amount of time? An yeah. hour, a day, a week, <laughs> what? Um, <laughs> ask a judge. <laughs> it would be something decided there. Um, <laughs> when, you're, when you're caught up in a bad situation. Yeah. yeah. I, I think what it comes down to is if you've seen any back and forth and you ask yourself, does that sound been, like a conversation? Has there been enough time? The answer is <coughs> yeah. I, but I, I don't know. I've answered my question. A day? A week? What? If it feels like a conversation, then it's crossing the line. Okay. All right. 
I mean, it strikes me as it's probably a rule of reason. The, the whole point is so that we make policy and open meetings. Right. And so if we're not doing that, we're probably fine. But, you know, it's just it takes good sense. Like, you know, we wouldn't all want to be replying and in, just including one complainant on a thread. And we're basically making policy rather than having the discussion here. That's right. So. OK, any other questions for Tom that he won't answer? <laughs> This is his last meeting, by the way. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is Tom's last meeting with us, so. Sure. There'll be a lot of questions I won't answer from here on out. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, your email is? All right, well, we're going to miss Blocked. you a lot. Well, we'll have to, we need a meeting with you tomorrow for about three, four hours to get our questions answered yeah, before you starting leave. At, starting at seven we'll get the in the most morning. out of you before you leave. We'll have to do it one-on-one, -one, one -on -one, though, so we don't violate any meeting laws. All right. Um, Unless anybody has any other business, we'll stand adjourned.